Um, and I'm a photographer as well. So let's. Uh, uh, this is currently. This picture is currently under consideration at the uh, Royal Western Academy um, for uh, an exhibition. So kind of fingers crossed on that one. Um, but that's yeah. That's just the the, the backdrop. Right. So uh, now is this mic on? How do we know if it's on? Because I have. So you are <laughs> Okay, I press the oh, unmute. Yeah. Is yeah. So with any luck, this is on. Brian, do we Go know on. that this yep, is on? Good. Is that you getting sound signal yep. on that? Yep. Perfect. Excellent. Right. Good. Um, okay. Uh, my son's a, my older son is a photographer as well. He took this one. Uh, credit where credit's due. Um, uh, I'll come back to chess a bit later. Um, so I quite like messing about with titles of talks, and this one I can't remember why I chose this one originally. It's a talk I did for a local user group uh, in Bristol, where I'm based, uh, a while back. Um, uh, but part of it was the fact that I do often talk about games and the role of um, uh, how to think about um, games, uh, sport, and so on, and the relationship to um, uh, agility. Um, with the world of software, we often find we have to draw parallels outside software so that we can learn about what we're trying to do in software. So I did that. Now, as it happens, um, yeah, that's me on the Iron Throne. So, you know, I, the second time I sat on the Iron Throne, this is 2016. Um, at XP, the XP conference in 2016, it was in Edinburgh, and they laid on a really good set of events uh, and ends, including getting the Iron Throne. If you're going to have the Iron Throne, you can't have it, you, you can't have it in an old castle. Turns out Scotland is filled with old castles. So th this is great. Second time I was on that. So yeah, that's um, uh, me trying to unite the seven kingdoms of uh, 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 software. Um, but when I'm not kind of reigning my dominion, um, I've been involved, and Brian mentioned, I've uh, edited a couple of books, so uh, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know uh, is one I've edited. Um, that seems to have proven quite popular in the craftsmanship community. Um, and I co-authored these two books, um, uh, which, although not immediately obviously relevant, uh, it's more, this one is more relevant perhaps, because we try and explore very much the nature of patterns. A lot of people misunderstand uh, patterns. They think they're kind of like a, there's a book that holds all the design knowledge you ever need, which is kind of sweet. Um, that's never going to happen. Uh, or rather, it might happen, but you'll take a forest to store all the things that we know about software development. Uh, but there is a deeper message that many people miss, which is this idea, a much, much simpler idea. So like, you know, let's show this with any, like you have some familiarity with this. Hopefully this is not the first time you've seen this. Um, although we seem to have kind of come full circle. I do often find that when I visit companies, there's an awful lot of emphasis on processes and tools. We seem to have come full circle. And it's just like, whoa, 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 we've forgotten the, the people thing, yeah? The whole individual's interaction. Yeah, 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 but what processes are we going to use? And, you know, how are you going to set up JIRA? And just, hang on, <laughs> let's, let's hold back a little bit. Um, the whole working software thing. They, they, they didn't throw the adjective working in there just for kicks. There, there is a reason it's there. You know, it's very carefully thought out. So there's, there's a bunch of stuff here. However, um, there was a little phase a few years ago. This is actually a surprisingly well-written um, manifesto. Uh, why I say surprisingly is because software developers are not always known for writing really good stuff. It's well-written uh, for a number of reasons. And I've read a few manifestos in my time. Uh, there is actually a book. Uh, I should have put a photograph of it up. Uh, 100 Artists' Manifestos, or um, uh, it's uh, 100 Artists' Manifestos of the 20th Century, I think is the full title. Um, it's, yeah, people were doing manifestos all over the place. So it was just, and you go through them, and they are original, they're fresh, they're provocative. This, when it came out, was exactly all of these things. Um, there's been a lot of copycats since, and the problem is they all copy this one. It's just like, no, 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 no. The whole point of a manifesto is if you go and look at the variety of artist manifestos, they didn't just copy each other. They sort of said, no, look, we're going to make a statement, and we're going to do it like this. Whereas everybody says, oh, that seems to work. Let's copy it. And that's not how you do it. But there's a, some really subtle points here. Let's look at the English. 
As Ryan said, I, I, I'm also a writer. I don't just write technical stuff. I write short fiction as well. And um, so I'm very, very interested in the detail of language. We are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. We are uncovering. That is the continuous present tense, or the uh, progressive present tense. It is something that doesn't exist in all languages. English has three present tenses, which kind of, in fact, most English speakers think that it has at most two. It has three. There's the future present, which is wonderful. Um, there's the present continuous, and there's the regular present, present perfect. The, what is the implication of this? It's the implication of continuity. We've been doing it, we're doing it, we're going to continue doing it. We're not done. There is no done done in improvement. There is, there is this idea of we are always doing this. We're on, a, we're on a journey here. And so whatever was done when this was written, we've moved on. We are continuing to do this. And we are helping others do it. And there's a whole bunch of value statements. So it's a very cleverly and very carefully written um, uh, piece here. Now, as I said, a lot of people were copying this manifesto a few years ago. Service-oriented architecture uh, was one of them. And around that time, I was doing some uh, work at a company in Norway. And I got really pissed off with this. We, what we were doing was pattern mining. We were going into their architecture and discovering what they already knew, or rather reformulating it. I, basically, I said, if I came in and joined your team next week, what kind of techniques do you use that I might not be familiar with? What are the kind of design styles that are idiomatic to your people, as it were? You know, what do you do here that you might not have seen documented elsewhere, but you, you take it for granted? So in other words, this was this whole idea of recovering and structuring knowledge and offering it to people. At that point, I came up with the Patterns Manifesto, informally. It's surprisingly simple. That was the purpose of it. We are encouraging better ways of developing software by seeing how others have already done it. The whole idea is that if you are having a problem, somebody has probably already done something similar and solved it. It is a matter of communication and propagation. It is not a matter of reinvention. It is a matter of discovery and communication. This is quite, this is quite key. This is the game we're playing. Um, now, the problem is we've ended up sloganizing everything. An example of sloganizing, this is quite an interesting one. This is a... Uh, 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 this is uh, in New York uh, a few years back, but actually it's taken from the work of uh, a couple of Swiss artists. And initially, and you can get T-shirts and cards and all the rest of it printed out. Now, initially, there's something here that looks okay, but you need to understand this is the whole thing about art. It is provocative. Some of this, yeah, do one thing at a time, and you see they go, yeah, working, yeah, you know, minimise. Work in progress. Uh, lower your whip count. Know the problem. OK. Learn to listen. Learn to ask questions. Distinguish sense from nonsense. Accept change is inevitable. Admit mistakes. Say, be calm. Smile. Hmm. That's an interesting one. As is that. And the wording of this is interesting. So far, this has all sounded like we might be on board with this. But there's something odd about this. There's something odd about the wording here. And be calm. Why would you tell somebody to be calm? In the whole history of people being upset, has be, be calm ever worked, just out of interest? You know, have you ever seen an argument where somebody says, calm down, and that's worked? It's not good. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. I, I had no idea what came over me. You're right. That, that's not how it works. Smile. That's a little bit. There's, a, there's something. OK, let's change the context. The context is that this was taken from a factory in Thailand. So this is what you're telling the regular factory workers. It's like, oh, you know what? This doesn't sound quite as constructive as we were hoping. And uh, this book, uh, Think Like an Artist, by Will Gompertz, he says, they satirize the reductive and banal nature of management speak. And this is the problem that we sometimes have. We, we have a good message. Sometimes it gets lost. And then somebody else picks it up, and they add a thing. And then before you know it, something that sounded really good, OK, let's reduce the number of things in progress kind of gets hijacked to something else, and you need to understand the context of it. So let's have a look at a manifesto that didn't quite work out the same way. This is the Craftsmanship Manifesto, OK? OK, so this was uh, 2009. It's got its heart, it, I've never, you know, heart in the right place. Absolutely no problem with that, OK? You know, the people are generally found out in software, people are generally not stupid or evil. That is not the problem we are normally trying to solve. But Somehow, this doesn't have the zing, the originality, the freshness of the original one. Um, as aspiring software craftsmen, we are raising the bar of professional software development by practicing and helping others learn the craft. Now, I'm already asleep here. 
Okay, I've, I've just about reached the end of the sentence and I'm thinking, mm, I'm not engaged here. It's, it's, you, haven't, you haven't said something that's exciting yet. Through this work, we have come to value not only work at software boards, okay, I'm, I'm still not getting anything, but not only responding change, but also steadily adding value. Now, I know this is pushing all the right buttons, but there is a problem here. Nobody gets out of bed to add value. And if you do, you are a very strange individual. You know, normally, there are other reasons we get out of bed. It turns out that when we talk I'm about... I'm not sure what everyone's experience with Scrum is, but this, this is meant to be just a crash course, just to... Oh. Uh, <laughs> so there's, there's a notion here that this idea of value is something that we agree on. It's a, it's a, it's a point that we say, okay, how are we going to talk about the business? How are we going to prioritize things? It turns out that what we are often doing is playing a game. What is the thing that we can agree on? And it's just like, yeah, we can meet our objectives by doing this. But most people get out, uh, get, out, get out of bed, they go into work. People change jobs, not in order just simply to add value, but there's something else that they want to do. And the one message everybody can agree on is this. It's like, okay, so there's a kind of a game. Let's find the right language and the right uh, set of concepts that we can agree on that allow us to further our own objectives individually or collectively. But sometimes we need something we can... Do. And this really is not a very exciting sentence at all. And you kind of asleep by the end. Um, and it's very, very, this, this one doesn't work. So let's look at something that is slightly more realistic for um, craft. It's a rather interesting book cover. It's a book I've got, Design After Modernism. Uh, it's about postmodernism, um, a series of very interesting essays. Um, it's one of my hobbies. I like taking pictures of books. You may have noticed. You know, um, first of all, books are a lot easier than people. You never can, they never smile at the wrong moment, uh, close their eyes, or anything like that. Uh, it also means I get simple copyright release on using the image. If you take the images from Amazon, it turns out people get upset by that. Um, there's a really interesting essay in here, "The Ideal World of Vermeer's Little Lace Maker" by Peter Dormer, and I think he better captures the internal, intrinsic motivation of why of some of the things that we actually care about, both technically and non-technically. Craft and craft-related activities are pleasurable. Now, I'm going to use that. I'm, so in, instantly, I've done something that is a little bit outside of people's normal experience of, why would I be interested in agile development? Here's a wild idea, because you might enjoy it. We're not allowed to talk about enjoyment. We talk about productivity. We talk about. I'm going to say you are allowed to enjoy yourselves. There is a permission here that needs to be granted. And this also tells us a motivation for doing things well, why the craft side of things cares. Imagine you had a group of people who enjoyed what they were doing. Wow, that would, half, half the discussion just disappears. And the pleasure derived from doing something well that you know well how to do. Now, the thing is, um, my kids can attest to this, because we, we, we kind of, don't let them just give stuff up. We're not mean parents, but if they want to try something, it's a case of like, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to try and stop doing it because it's not enjoyable, because it's the first time you've done something. It turns out, so, you know, the, my, my younger one now plays bass. Um, started with guitar. Originally, yeah, I don't want to do this. I can't do it. Well, no, you can't because you've just started. Now, the older one now plays drums. And again, we said, you know, we'll get you a drum kit if you stick to it for six months. And it's just like, now he's in a band. It's the whole thing. You've got to get over that bit where you're not doing it well, where it doesn't give you the reward that you're hoping for, and then get better at it. And suddenly, it's just like, oh, I can't imagine not doing this. And so there is that. We'd like to bring some of that into the world of software development. There is this idea that perhaps this is, this is the way to look at things. And so this is a much stronger motivation. This is a definition of craft that I would immediately sign up to, whereas um, the previous one doesn't motivate me. Although it might speak some truths, it doesn't speak to my, well, my inner motivation, my heart. So let's have a look at this. this now, it's entirely possible this has been updated in recent years. There are multiple versions. But I'm going to quote the Scrum Primer from a few years ago. Let's talk about some things that are said that might not be the whole truth. Uh, again, Scrum works by making visible the dysfunction and impediments that are impacting the product owner and the team's effectiveness so that they can be addressed. Is that how Scrum works? By pointing out that things don't work? 
Is that, is that really how it works? I think Scrum works by getting people together, by harnessing group intelligence. This is a, this is a sideshow. Interestingly enough, if you look back through the history of Scrum, this only appeared around 2005, this kind of wording. I remember first seeing Jeff Sutherland using the word dysfunction around 2005. I remember raising my eyebrow a bit, going like, that's different from all the other stuff I've read. I wasn't sure that was why we did it. The point here is it's not just about making visible the dysfunction. You Imagine somebody comes up to you and points out you're doing something wrong. Are you instantly going to correct it? Is that, are you motivated suddenly to correct it? Is that enough to solve it? Have you got the intelligence? To, are you motivated? No, you're not. This is not how things work. Otherwise, we'd all eat well and we'd all be incredibly fit and all the rest of it. We know how to eat well. It's out there. It's, it's in magazines. It's in books. That's just not how humans work. This is the problem. This is not how humans work. So this might be part of it. We do want to make things visible, but that's not how it works. The Scrum framework will quickly reveal these weaknesses. Yeah, anyone with a show? Great. Scrum does not solve the problems of development. It makes them painfully visible and provides a framework to people to explore ways to resolve it. It's an interesting thing. If you look at these very carefully, you'll notice they're written by different people or at different times, uh, these two paragraphs. Um, the words here are more regular and shorter. Um, this uses words like dysfunction and impacting, over which there is a continuing debate. Is that actually a verb? Um, yes is the answer since the 17th century. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's acceptable in uh, normal so. So these are actually written by slightly different people. They actually say slightly different things. Four. Yeah. Four. So, hmm. Four. 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 <laughs> four people. Yeah, oh yeah, no, no, yes. There are four people, four four authors on this. But these two paragraphs were written at different times. Um, I couldn't tell you whose hands have been in them at a particular time. But there is an interesting difference in terms of wording. Now this is the problem. We tend to see. <sighs> This whole question of how do humans actually work? Scrum, and indeed any kind of process that you're trying to apply, needs somehow to respect the fact that there are humans involved. This is the whole individuals and interactions. The problem is often we go about saying, well, if humans work like this, then here's how we'd, how we'd go about it. Well, they don't. They don't. We, we, that, that kind of uh, approach doesn't work out quite so well. So here's an interesting one. <coughs> Um, this is from the Financial Times a few years ago. It has become commonplace to suggest that failure is good for entrepreneurs. This is actually very much a business <coughs> orthodoxy. Um, in this view, failure that comes about early in a founder's career can teach them important lessons about doing business and harden them up for the next startup attempt. In the UK, the evidence is that novices are neither more nor less likely to have a business than, that either grows or survives than experienced founders. In Germany, where much more extensive statistical work has been undertaken, it is clear that those whose business had failed had worse performing businesses if they restarted than did novices. Business orthodoxy, so basically bankruptcy law in the US and in the UK, basically says we should, it is designed around the premise of the first paragraph. Now, what can cause it? So, in other words, in short, the assumption entrepreneurs use the lessons of their own experience to improve their chances of creating a series of profitable business is not borne out by the evidence. Now, why would this be? Now, there's a very important word in the first paragraph, which kind of is easy to overlook. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can teach them. Doesn't say will teach them. There is this is a little assumption. So somebody's had, a fa somebody's had an experience. Therefore, they will be better at doing the same thing later. Or will they just sort of double down and do the same thing again? Just harder. That didn't work for this company. We obviously weren't trying that hard enough. We're going to do it again. We're going to do it even harder. And we're going to be even more committed to the way that we were doing it. Is actually, unfortunately, um, uh, we're not going to blame anybody. It, it turns out that it's um, a common trait of human beings. It turns out that if humans weren't involved in software, the whole thing would be a lot easier. But humans have these fallacies, these foibles. Uh, a lovely book by Gary Marcus a few years ago, Kluge, The Haphazard Evolution of the Human Mind. Uh, a kluge, there are various spellings of it, a solution that is clumsy or inelegant yet surprisingly effective. This thing is a mess up here, what's going on inside your head. Um, it's amazing we're actually able to create civilization, but he says no matter what humans think about, we tend to pay more attention to stuff that fits in with our beliefs than stuff that might challenge them. Okay. This is called confirmation bias. It's been a lot more 
Um, it's made the business literature a lot more in the last 10 years. Uh, but it's this very simple idea that we are a mess of biases and um, shortcuts about how we reason about the world. When you've embraced a theory, we're going to do a business like this, we're going to develop in this style, we're going to enter this market in this way with this product. We tend to be better at noticing things that support rather than evidence that might run counter to it. So it turns out, and if you go to, if you haven't already done it, go to Wikipedia, look up cognitive biases. If you read one cognitive bias a day, that will take you well into next summer. There are so many. And this is a, this is a really important point, is there's this whole idea of us being rational. We're not. We're human beings. And it turns out, and one of the most, one of the most profound revelations of the last decade or so um, about software developers is that software developers are also human. Now, this is news to a lot of people, but it turns out that means that software developers have exactly the same fault lines running through their reasoning as everybody else. And they are blind to the very things that they don't believe that they are. And in fact, we actually have names for all this kind of stuff. So a lovely way of looking at human beings and why we are these successful messes. Um, any psychologist will tell you pretty much everything you think and do is coloured by biases. And typically, you're unaware of them. So you don't see the world as it is. You see it through a veil of, uh, of biases and uh, assumptions and uh, uh, so on. Um, and there is, this is the wonderful one. And people often tell me, and I did a, a series of talks a few years ago in some companies about cognitive biases. Uh, oh, so you've, and people would say, yes, I've noticed this in my colleagues. <laughs> you've just experienced the illusion of naive realism, the conviction that you, and perhaps you alone, perceive the world as it really is. And then anybody who sees it differently is biased. It's you lot, not me. It's you lot that are biased. Yes, I agree with everything Kevin says. Everybody else is biased that I've encountered at work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, funny, they have the same view. Uh, we even have a name for this bias that you have. Um, you have fallen foul of another aspect of the illusion, the bias blind spot. So the bias that everybody else has biases except you is a bias. Yeah, it's called the bias blind spot. So once we've acknowledged this, this should offer us a little more humility. Because it turns out that if you wish to do things well, this game of software development, this whole thing, how are you going to get better at it? Some of these practices, they are offered to you. They are, they're not the end game, they're the starting point. Okay, that's, a, that's quite an important consideration. So you've got to go in saying, I have absolutely no idea how we are going to make this a successful team, how we're going to develop this and be a success, have it as a successful product. And this is you with experience. You've got to start, really start at a very humble level. Because otherwise you're going to fall into this self-sufficiency um, uh, gap. So Christopher Walken, um, great actor. Well, he plays one role really worked very well. Um, uh, he's got that one absolutely down pat. Uh, and he said, you know, if you want to learn how to build a house, build a house. Don't ask anybody. Just build a house. Great actor. Terrible, terrible educator. I mean, such bad advice. How many... So there's this idea. We have this idea of self-sufficiency and self, being self-taught. Okay, yeah, I did this. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, and I'm self-reliant. Yeah, there's a, there's a beautiful narrative there. There is a story. There's a creation myth and everything. How hard is it to build a house? Pretty tough. And uh, did you have help? Did you have advice? Did you learn from other people? Uh, well, yeah. Okay. That was that was already knowing what other people know. Okay, and taking advantage of people's knowledge. If you don't, then what happens? Well, how how many ways can a house go wrong? Modern house. Oh, electricity. That's always fun. How many ways can you get electricity in a house wrong? Well, I don't know. How many how many houses do you want to burn down? Well, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah. Structural stuff. Yeah. You end up with the, the learning lesson. You speak, to, you speak to your friend who's now built their fifth house. The other, the other four we do not speak of. They built their fifth house. And you go, oh, OK, so you've gone for a single story house. Yeah, yeah, I prefer single story houses. What you actually discover is they don't know how to build a second floor that's structurally sound. So they've, they've opted out rather than actually recognizing they have a problem there. Hey, Jim, I noticed you haven't got any right angles in your house. Yeah, that's just my style. This is the really interesting thing. What happens is people start to own their mistakes, but not the way we talk about owning their mistakes. That's how I do it. 
Uh, and I mentioned to Ricardo on the drive over here. Very briefly, I have done, um, I've done some work at games companies. And games companies are great, particularly some of the console games companies a few years ago. The market's changed a bit in how they do it. But everybody had taught themselves how to program. Everybody had crafted their own bits, their own ones and zeros, and regarded C as a ridiculously high-level language. OK, well, yeah, you know, I've done my time in the trenches, the assembler. Yeah, I use C. C++, that seems a little bit high level. What's that, Java? I don't know. And it showed in their code. They had the most bizarre ways of doing stuff. And it's just like you do know there's a whole discipline that people have figured out how to build some of this stuff and do some of this stuff. These are solved problems. Software, it's hard enough to build a house. Something like software is insanely difficult. Some of the hardest stuff that humans built in terms of its intrinsic complexity. You don't want to do this alone. You want to take advantage of the fact that there are other people who know things. This is knowledge work. There's a reason it's called knowledge work. So, the, so yes, feel free to make some mistakes, but for heaven's sakes, make some new ones. We've already seen the old ones. You know? Make fresh, original, exciting mistakes. Build on other people's knowledge. So there's this whole idea that if you're going to play this game well, there is something we're doing. It's a collaborative game. There's a team game going on here. And it's not about passing the ball, it's about passing knowledge. The whole point of this game, as we got better and better at it, is the sharing of, here's something I tried. Maybe it'll work for you, maybe it won't. Here's a piece of code that already exists. Here is a library. If you look at what we've built up, that is quite impressive. Yeah? The ability to share knowledge. Because otherwise you end up with the whole self-taught thing. Okay? Does anybody know the story of this one? Okay, this is uh, 2011, 2012. Um, uh, it looked like this. Okay, so this was actually um, painted in, uh, I think, southern Spain in a church. Um, not necessarily the most notorious, um, uh, well, not, not the most famous uh, or best art, but it's sitting in a church there. Um, over the years, it decayed. So 80 years later, it looked like this. So the church was interested in how do we restore it? We need to raise funds to restore it. So a local woman, ah, she was in her late, she's in her late 70s at the time, Cecilia Jimenez. She snuck into the church one night <laughs> and restored it. <laughs> this became an internet phenomenon. There is even a musical about it now. Okay? Now, they are, they are left with the interesting situation of they've actually, the church has now made loads of money because people visit just to see that. <laughs> So if they restore it to that, it's just like, yeah, not interested anymore. But here's the whole thing. <sighs> Senora Jimenez did this for a very simple reason. In, in her old age, she had taken up painting. You, know, well, you, have to, you have to spend your time doing something. And you know what her family would have said? Oh, your paint's so good, Grandma. You know, it's just like, yeah, this is so good, yeah. Oh, you paint so well. And it's just like, yeah, they're going to give her all the right stuff. They're not going to give her hard-edged feedback. You know, this is not a business environment. This is your grandmother you're talking about. Your mother, she's in the twilight years of her life. You're going to give her all the support that she needs. You paint so well. I'm going to save the local church money. So, again, the heart is in the right place. People don't do this typically because they're evil. Yeah, there's not, you know, people often look, oh, there must be some malicious thing. No, no, no. Actually, things go wrong in software projects and in restoration projects. Normally because people are trying to do something right, but they've not necessarily reached out and said, okay, I might need a bit of support here. Okay? You need to have some kind of honest feedback. It doesn't have to be hurtful. And this whole idea of how many ways can we do something wrong. In software, you can, it's, it's unbounded. So have you seen the uh, oh really joke book covers? <laughs> Yeah, these are wonderful. There's, a hard, there's one for every occasion. But trying stuff until it works. <laughs> Expert trying stuff until it works. Yeah? This is the problem. The search space is enormous. Here are all the things you could possibly do. All the practices, all the techniques, all the ways you could code, all the ways you can organize a team and communicate. Here they all are. And here's the ones that turn out to be effective. You can wander the desert for 40 years or more, never hitting this spot. Just by making a mistake. And this is an important idea. When it comes to learning from mistakes and showing dysfunction, it turns out that sometimes we can learn from mistakes, but we are not guaranteed to do so. And, and sometimes that is us, but sometimes it's also the complexity of the situation. So uh, 
So I got two boys. The older one turns out he's very good at spelling, which is in, you know, for a language like English, where sometimes people get frustrated with English because they say, there is no logical, it doesn't have a logical system of spelling. By the way, if you believe that, you are wrong. It has half a dozen logical systems of spelling. <laughs> that is the problem. If it had only one, we'd be good. So my older son, he's really good with this stuff. Um, so the, in his primary school, so I guess when he was about eight or nine, every Friday they would have a spelling test. And they had 10 words in the week or 12 words in the week that they had to learn. And so I remember walking back with him one day from school. And I said, so how'd you do? And he said, oh, I got 11 out of 12. Oh, which one did you get wrong? And he could tell me. How did you spell it? Oh, how should it be spelled? Yeah. You see, if you normally get things right, and then one thing happens that's not quite right, it's quite easy to spot and remember. I compare that with the conversation I had with my younger son, who's dyslexic. How many did you get right? Six. Do you remember what you got wrong? No. Well, if you normally get things wrong, if half of what you do is wrong, if you live in a world of chaos, so you can relate this to a lot of businesses, it's no good having all of the dysfunction shown you. If you, you are doing everything else right and there's one problem, it's a lot easier to fix that than it's all a world of chaos. Well, how, where do you start? Okay. Has anybody come across the Kinevin framework? Okay, a couple of you. It's, it's basically to do with complex adaptive systems, but it's very much in that. In simple systems, it's very easy to say that's different, that's wrong, and everything else is well ordered and understood. I can learn from that. When you're in a chaotic system, <laughs> don't, don't read into anything you learn too deeply. Yeah? Um, you have to be very careful with that. So there is this idea that it's not enough to do that. You need to take advantage of other people's knowledge. How are we going to do this? Well, we're going to build stuff, and we're going to learn from other people. Um, there is a name for this, empirical, based on concern with or verifiable by observation, yeah, derived from experience, capable of being verified. You see, there's a problem in software that we have. There's an awful lot of belief. Does that work? I believe it does. Yeah, you know, well, that's not quite the same as working software. Does it work? I believe so. Yeah. Have we met the customers? I believe, belief is a lovely thing, but, you know, that might not be your business model. We trade in beliefs and optimism. Yeah. Optimism and hope is not really quite a strategy. So we need to be able to say, OK, here's, here's what we believe. We've got a pipeline that verifies these things and shows us what we're expecting. And you know what? Sometimes we're wrong. And sometimes we need to explore why we're wrong. OK, so maybe we have a process for this. So here's a book that my experience, surprisingly few people who do Scrum have ever read. And it was the first book, actually, to the best of my knowledge, that actually used the word agile in its title. Problem with this book is that it doesn't have very good production values. It, doesn't, it feels like it's almost self-published. Uh, but the first three chapters are absolutely golden. Because they set out the stall. They actually talk a lot more about the philosophy um, of what's going on here. And uh, Ken Schraber and the late Mike Beadle make it very clear that when we're talking about processes, you're trying to tune a process into its context. What does that look like? So talk about the defined process control model. Every piece of work be completely understood. Given a well-defined set of inputs, the same outputs are generated every time. Huh. And then they contrast this with the empirical process control model. A lot of people forget that Scrum is supposed to be an empirical approach. It's just like the whole point of empirical is that we are exploring things. We are dealing with things that are not entirely known. And there's this lovely, almost Monty Python-esque phrase. Um, we expect the unexpected. That's what it's doing. And there is this whole idea of the whole point of this process is to engage in the unknown. It is not simply to offer certainty, but it's actually saying, you know what, there's a bunch of stuff we don't know. But it's okay, we're going to find out. You see, that's the other bit. It's not that it's, there's a bunch of stuff we don't know, our hands are raised in the air, we surrender. No, it's actually, but that's okay. We've done, we've done the not knowing thing before and we've figured out how to find out stuff that we don't know. We've got this. That's, what you that's the confidence you need to exude to the business. It provides and exercises control through frequent inspection and adaptation for processes that are imperfectly defined and generate unpredictable and unrepeatable results. Now, I have shown this to a room of project managers before, and they've gone, oh, I don't like that. Can I have the one previous? You know, I like this one. And it's just like, no, you misunderstand me. <laughs> I wasn't offering you a choice. 
But let's go back here and look in a little. Uh, but so I, I looked at this. Yeah, I've looked at this over the years, and the first thing that struck me is people say, you know, that's not like software development. You know, it is. What? Can you give me an example of something that, when we give a well-defined set of inputs, we get the same outputs generated every time? Function. Function. Even better, a compiler. Mm -hmm. We solved this problem in 1957. It was called Fortran. It was the first proper high-level language compiler. It was kind of done as a bet. Well, not quite a bet. I'd like to think there was a bet involved. John Backus and his team at IBM did what nobody thought was possible at the time, which is create an automatic translation system that gave you code that was of comparable efficiency to what a human would write. People just said, oh, that's never going to happen. Give me two and a half years, I'll show you it can be done. The whole point is, we figured out how to take a well-defined set of input. And everything else is history. What we have done progressively over subsequent decades is get better at this. We start looking at things, we do them, and then we start going, you know what, I think we've understood this well enough. I think we can automate this. So what we've done is progressively move this out into the other areas of software development. Okay? You, go back, you don't have to go back too far to find when people talked about integration, they normally talked about a person. Okay. Oh, Jane, she does integration. She's been doing it for five years. She's our integration <coughs> person. It's just like, what? You have a person? Oh, yeah. That's their, that's their specialism. Yeah, only they, they there's, you know, once every six months, you, you just feed them coffee and pizza and you don't talk to them. You might expect a few strong words and some very colorful language, you know. Yeah, so, uh, hey, you're not a native English speaker. Go stand next to Jane when she's doing integration. You will learn a lot more English than standing anywhere else. Okay? So there is a point here that what do we now do with integration? We have, we have, we have a profusion of tools. We can, we've moved from potentially months to minutes. So the point is what we've been progressively doing is getting better at saying, you know, uh, we've understood this well enough. It is well defined. We have enough knowledge to say we know what the shape of that landscape is. Now, there's an interesting question. That all sounds very optimistic. But what does it leave behind? <laughs> it means all the other stuff that we haven't yet covered is not very well defined. OK, we're getting really good at this. This is your tools bit, OK? Get better at this. but. What's left over? Ah, that's, that's the uncertain bit. That's this bit. They are imperfectly defined. Doesn't mean we know nothing, it's just that we might be surprised by a few things. And then, I had a, an epiphany a few years ago. Unrepeatable results. Unpredictable and unrepeatable. That sounds initially very negative. But it's the basis of learning. When you do something the first time, Maybe it takes you a while. So I noticed this when my wife and I uh, remodeled our first house. We've never actually gone the whole length of trying to build uh, a house from scratch. Um, uh, that's not really a done thing in the UK. No, we just deal with houses that are quite old, it seems. Um, yeah, the, the, house, the first house we remodeled was built in, I remember describing it to somebody. And uh, they said, so how old is this house you keep referring to? And I said, it was built in 1847. Hang on, we're in Colorado. Our house is older than your state. Yes, uh, <laughs> so, and you'd be surprised at the self-taught things people would do over the centuries. Okay? But one of the things that we got good at was estimating how long it, take, uh, how long it took to decorate a room. We could fine-tune it to the time we could tell when we were going to walk into the pub as a reward to ourselves at the end of the day. First time, you know, you kind of, oh, yeah, paints, brushes, move this. Oh, yeah, I forgot to do that. Oh, yes, I need to go and get that. Or, ah, oh, I should lay newspaper down. I should do... Yeah, and you're being a little bit tentative. And eventually, you get really good at it. Now, the first time you do this, it's going to take you a lot longer. Do you want that to be the metric by which you then predict everything else? No, I want it to be... I don't want to repeat my first time. Thank you very much. I've learned. I'm not going to make the same mistakes. I've acquired skill, I hope. Okay, the whole idea is that you're, when you're learning, your activities are unrepeatable. The whole point of improvement is that you're not doing what you were doing before exactly the same. You're doing it better. That, that's how you get improvement. Repeatability is the death of improvement. Okay? So there's a, I, I find that there is a cheerfully optimistic message here. But it's very well hidden. 
So how, how do you get better at stuff? How do, we t how do we combine this idea of knowledge, learning? In fact, what we're seeing here is we've got a process that is a knowledge acquisition process. Okay? By the way, if you are looking to pitch this to higher ups in an organization, and you're trying to say, OK, so this is how we're going to structure our development process. You can say, ah, we are organizing our development process around, um, uh, we're structuring it uh, around knowledge acquisition and retention and propagation. That sounds brilliant. See all those words? They're really long, and they've got, they, they've got weight to them. Everybody else calls it learning, which is a lot shorter. So you use that word when you talk to one another. But if you, knowledge acquisition, yeah, that's what we do. Yeah, knowledge retention and propagation, yeah. Oh. Right, so how do we do this? How do we blend all of these desires and wishes and also the fact that we want to enjoy ourselves? You know, you sh uh, you know there's a challenge. You can learn some stuff, but at the same time, there's, you want to do things well. There's a balance here. So the deming shiart cycle. Now, this is a room full of people who are familiar with process stuff. Seen this? Yeah, familiar? Maybe you know it better as PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. The original formulation was Plan, Do, Study, Act. And... I tend to rest on this version. I prefer study. And there's a very simple reason I prefer study. I, I just want to, I want you to savor the words a moment. Study, check. Which one sounds faster? Check. check. Yeah, I don't want you to check. I want you to study. Learning does not come from checking. It comes from studying. There is a deeper message here. <clears throat> Slow down. Stop. We're not very good at this bit. Getting people to do this is one thing. And when you teach people the value of planning, there is something there. I remember, you know, I studied, you know, as a, as a teenager, I programmed. I had a question from my kids a while back. Dad, how did you develop software, you know, back in the dark ages? Yeah. What, what did you do? Because there was no internet. You know, what, what on earth would you actually be doing? You know, what, what could possibly be enjoyable? I remember telling you, well, there was an awful lot of doing. There's a lot of hacking. And you're getting pleasure just from that. But there's a scalable maximum beyond which you cannot get. Because it turns out that your program's a mess. You've, you've cobbled it together out of self-taught ingenuity, but oh, you can't add anything to it. And then somebody teaches you the value of planning. And planning operates two, in two ways. We use the word plan to refer to plan in time and plan in space. A building plan, but also a plan of sequenced events. And I mean it in both senses. Somebody shows you a simple technique for organizing your code. You say, oh, why did I not know this before? They tell you about certain activities, and you might want to organize them in time. You think, this is brilliant. And then what do you do? Well, you go and join a company. It turns out they do plan and do. Sadly, they do plan, 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 plan. Do, 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 do. Yeah, right activities, but you might have, we might need to a little bit of mixing here. And then eventually, plan, do, plan, do, plan, do. So far, what we've just done to get to plan, do, plan, do is what many people who are adopting Scrum get as far as. What they're doing is iterative and incremental, but it's not agile yet. That you've got to push through here. The problem here is that this stuff is less visible. It's like there's a water line here. You don't see what's below the water. What do a room full of people planning look like? Well, they look like a room full of people doing stuff. And you can see the plan. Doing, there's outcomes of doing. There's code, there's tests, there's demos. This is brilliant. What a group of people studying and acting. Well, acting, yeah. But what does a room full of, these are not obviously visible. They don't have direct artifacts that we can point to. This is not about the software directly. That produces the software. These are almost invisible. So therefore, because we cannot see them, we value them less. We, we, we struggle to prioritize them. But it's actually this bit that you need to kind of slow down on. Study and but act. Question. Yeah. I thought the most advanced agile people would build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, go through that cycle as fast as possible. That's what learning is. Uh, yeah, but people skip steps. Or rather, they get become obsessed with the cycle. They don't, they, they, it's the fine grain, it's the, it's the granularity that is important. There's the actual speed. In fact, there's a lovely uh, way of putting this that we don't want to. A lot of people seem to be aiming for faster. That's actually wrong. What agile development should give you is sooner. Sooner is not the same as faster. 
And that, so in other words, you will find people who do this effortlessly, but actually what they're doing a bunch of other stuff that is not shown here, so to speak. So I think the sooner versus faster thing is, is really, and a lot of that comes through, get the knowledge so you are able to move more effortlessly. I have a very poor sense of direction, was, uh, you know, I, and so I, so one of the things that my wife and I do not share is a sense of direction. Um, uh, she has, I mean, she can direct down to the nearest lamppost. You know, she can give you directions and say, oh, you take the second lamppost on the right and then there's a pub and then there's an old tree, but the tree's been cut down and da da da. And I'm sitting there going like, I have no idea, north or south. Why is this relevant? Because occasionally we end up with two cars, for whatever reason, we've ended up in the same location, we come from different things or at different times, and it's a case of, right, I'll see you back home. And we've got two kids, it's like, okay, who's coming with dad, who's going with mum? And who's going to get home first? I always drive faster. I have the speeding points to prove it. <laughs> I drive faster. My wife always gets home sooner. Yeah? A lot of people seem to be trying to do what I'm doing. Trust me, do, not, yeah, do as I say, not as I do on this one, okay? You want sooner. And sometimes that's knowledge. My wife has much better street knowledge and street sense than I do. And that's the one you want to nurture. It's the, uh, the quote um, from the Thai um, monk, peace and slow. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's the, this the bit. This is this whole bit down here. And the point you said about measure, people often imitate the measurement activity, but not the depth of the measurement. That becomes the difference between the people who do it well and the people who don't. It's not that they're measuring, it's that they understand how to respond and, uh, and deal with the measurement and the various implications it can have. A, a measurement does not give you an answer, it gives you a question. A lot of people think it's an answer. You know, if, you measure, if I see metrics about the complexity or the technical debt in my system, I don't know the answer yet because I've just been given the question. What would explain these results? Hmm, that's interesting. In fact, it's an Isaac Asimov quote that very little science is about eureka moments. It's mostly scientists going, that's funny. That is, again, it's this observation. And some of that is all about the slowing down. It's looking like, I'm not sure I understand that. And that's perfectly fine. And then exploring that. And somebody gives you a number and you go, oh, we must fix that. Wait a minute. I don't think I... I mean, I've got one answer to this, but maybe it's not that answer. And that is this why I think this bit need, deserves the equal weighting. We often, if you look at how people, they pay lip service, this definitely gets lip service in a lot of places, but this is where the, it's, on, it's not out of sight because it's on the bottom half. It's, it's on the bottom half because it's the foundation. And you build on that. That turns out to be the important bit. So, uh, so a few years ago, I wrote this one as trying to try and capture this kind of whole philosophy, starting from a position of incomplete knowledge and gradually iterating through hypothesis, experiment, and discovery towards what would hope working software addresses part of the question of moving from the unknown to the known. What is a code base? What is your software? Your software is built out of code. Code, it turns out, is a convenient shorthand for codified knowledge. I know that's not the original abbreviation, but I'm going to play with words here. Because if you think about it, that's what it is. What is technical debt in that case? It's kind of ideas we thought of last year but haven't really updated ourselves to think of freshly. What you want, and I had this with a team when I said, your code base is a reflection of your knowledge, and they suddenly looked at each other and go, oh, that's really bad. <laughs> our thinking is, and I said, it's a reflection of your thinking. They said, well, our thinking is really messed up. And I said, right, you know, because what you want is, here is what we believe. This is what we believe the business wants and the way we believe is currently the best technical solution. Whereas what you get is, and here's what we thought two weeks ago, three months ago, two years ago, ten years ago, and by people we've never met, and we don't understand why they thought this, but we're thinking this as well. This part of the system believes that uh, uh, the sun goes around the earth, this part of the system believes the opposite, and some, we've, suddenly we've got an integration project. Yeah? If you look at it as a reflection of thinking, that gives you a much better idea. This is knowledge work, codified knowledge. That is what your code base is, and it suddenly makes you reevaluate um, what you're trying to do. So, I mentioned uh, I write stories. Um, there's this uh, book called Story. It's about screenplays, Robert McKee. Some, it's a little formulaic in places, but there's some really good observations in here. And there's this lovely quote here. Um, if a plot works out exactly as you first planned, you're not working loosely enough to give room to your imagination and instincts. That's a really interesting thought here. 
about this idea that let us imagine that we did come up with a plan and we did follow it and everything went according to plan. One part of us might be very satisfied with the success. But perhaps if you're a more curious type and perhaps if you find reward in learning, you might be slightly disappointed. Everything went as expected. We learnt nothing. How disappointing. Yeah? We didn't learn better ways of doing anything. We didn't learn alternative ways. It went as planned. You know? It's like the slight disappointment um, of, uh, of particle physicists when they discovered the Higgs boson. It's like, oh, where's the new physics? We were hoping that we wouldn't find it and therefore it would be exciting. There'd be stuff we wouldn't know. We'd have to come up with new explanations and explore, but it kind of works. It leaves us unsatisfied. So there's actually a, a, some terminology here. So this, um, I, like I said, I like taking pictures of books. Uh, this is, uh, I run a page on uh, Facebook on words and language. You know, it's called Word Friday. And, and most of the week I just post articles and things that I've found, but every Friday, or most Fridays, I will post a word that is unusual. That's how the whole thing started. Uh, I remember driving, driving in the car many years ago, and the guy on the radio said, so what is another word for thesaurus? <laughs> and I said, synonymicon. That is a real word. It is one of the words, it, uh, it is a synonym for thesaurus. And so I suddenly thought, yeah, that's not a great, you know, maybe I should do a page of these words and just uh, do this every Friday. So, unusual words. Here's an unusual word, pantser. A pantser, this comes from the creative writing community. A writer who writes by the seat of their pants. Okay? Um, now, I cannot remember which author it is, but the author was, um, uh, he was asked by his daughter, Daddy, why are you typing so fast? because I want to find out what happens next. Okay? And there's this whole idea, the very act of doing unfolds it. It reveals you. You've got an idea of where you might go, but the very detail suddenly brings out new questions and new possibilities. And software is like that. You, it's, it's surprising. The only way to plan software in detail is to code it. That is the detail that you get. That's where you find the problem, but also where you find the subtleties. And you get the curious thing that what you thought, what developers might think, oh, this is a coding issue. No, actually, this is a deeper requirements issue. We just didn't know it was a requirements issue until you pushed that question so hard that it manifested in precision. The thing about code is it's not hand wavy. There's no kind of like, stand in front of my keyboard, you know what I mean, compiler? No, I don't. <laughs> There's none of this. You have to say exactly. It does not have the kind of looseness that we have in everyday uh, uh, business conversations. So therefore you are pushing a piece of knowledge to its very edge and that's where you find out it has gaps. And then, so it's not a coding problem that most developers find. It's actually something in the domain. Okay, so it's misclassified. Um, in contrast to a plotter. Yeah, so this is, this is, now sometimes people think of this as being a binary distinction. Um, because humans are very simple, we like the world to be simple, we want everything to be, you know, it's on, it's off, it's one, it's zero. It's a spectrum. But in this, you can also see something that we see in software. You can see different personalities. Oh, I'm a plotter, I'm a pantser. You know, you can see that what we're doing is we're trying to push things a little bit away from the plotter end of things to the pantser end of things. We're creating something new. Perhaps we need to be open to the idea that there are new things. So this also takes us somewhere else. Um, so, does anybody work somewhere where they are encouraging people or have used test-driven development? Okay, good. Red, green, refactor. That's how people always teach test -driven. Yeah, Write a test that doesn't work. Yeah, to write a test that fails. <laughs> now, there's a, deeper, there's a deeper story to that, but many years ago I found this was surprisingly weak motivation. <laughs> you tell a developer, I need you to write a test that fails. Well, that's no ambition. Yeah. I need you to write a test that fails. OK, now I'm going to make it pass. Well, yeah. Now I'm going to refact. We're looking at events. We're looking at external things. But what we've not done is recognize there is something deeper going on here. It's this. This is much better as a description of the test-driven cycle. Plan. Here's what I'm going to do next. This is what I believe I want. Fulfill it. Now take a step back. I've split the refactoring step into two. 
Take a step back, look at it. Are there any trends in the code? Duplication smells. Questions I've yet to ask. Are there any trends occurring across the tests that hint that I may be describing the domain in the wrong way? That what I thought was a functional solution is actually not a functional solution at all. It's, it's got a different characteristic. OK, now I've thought about it. You see, I really want to make this a little long bit. Now make it so. So write, reify, make real, reflect, refactor. It's the very same structure, just small. It's, a, it's supposed to be a learning cycle. Of course, you have an idea of how it might work, but you are exploring this and trying to give yourself the benefit of the doubt that you might see things that you haven't seen before. I found that every time I write something TED, I start out with a vision of something, and then the detail manifests itself, but also I get a few surprises, some, some of which are surprisingly good and time-saving. You, you only see, if you're driving slowly enough, you see a lot more scenery. It's just like, yeah, it's a solved problem. I know this. Or I know someone who can tell me about this. You have to slow down a bit. So James Grenning wrote this book, TDD for Embedded C. Um, it's mentioning out there. I, I, like, I, like this, I like this book um, for a number of reasons. And I like quoting this bit for, for a number of reasons. One of which is because everybody says we're special. We, we, we can't do that here. We're, so, we're super special because we're, we're, we're this big, that shape, that whatever. We're in this domain or whatever. And you know, we've got the best people or the worst people or something. I don't know. There's always something that is special. Embedded C is a very special domain indeed. And yet somehow you can do it. So therefore, you'd better be more special than this okay? if you've got an excuse for not doing it. And James also offers a really good explanation, a very good motivation that ties many threads together. TDD is fun. It's like a game where you navigate a maze of technical decisions that lead to highly robust software while avoiding the quagmire of long debug sessions. With each test, there is a renewed sense of accomplishment and clear progress towards the goal. This is really important because it turns out, a study done um, about 10 years ago, uh, knowledge workers are most strongly motivated by sense of progress. Okay? It turns out that if they feel that they've done something, learned something, made progress in a day, that is, a, that is itself a reward. Automated tests record assumptions, capture decisions, and free the mind to focus on the next challenge. So this is a really good summary of this stuff. But I'm going to focus on just the first sentence. Mm. I started earlier on mentioning this, and it seems like I haven't returned to it. I'm absolutely going to return to it. Why should it not be fun? I did a workshop in um, uh, Izmir in Turkey a few years ago for a, a telecoms company. And almost guiltily, one of the participants came up to me afterwards. I, and she said to me, I didn't realize software could be this much fun. I mean, I did it at university because it was a, a good subject and there are decent jobs you can get. But actually, this was really enjoyable. Is that OK? <laughs> Honestly, you don't have to ask me for permission, you know? But there is this notion that we don't value that enough. That fun is a self-perpetuating structure. Okay? Enjoyment. When people are happy, it turns out that most of the problems people experience do not need to be solved because they just dissolve away. Not every problem, but let's at least try and get rid of the easy stuff. And then he says it's like a game. Now, this is interesting. I've kind of mentioned game and various things on and off, and it's in the title of this talk. How do we understand what kind of game it is? And Alistair Coburn had this observation a number of years ago that I absolutely love. Software development as a cooperative game. When we talk about most games, and particularly sports, there is a sense of competition. There is a sense of winning and losing. Okay? Um, these are often kind of at some level zero sum games in that sense. Um, games like football, the proper version, yeah. and football, the version that is played over here. That's why we have an Atlantic Ocean, just reminding you there. Uh, firewall. Um, but the version that is played with the feet and the, the ball shaped ball, and the version that is not. Um, these are bounded in time. They are bounded in the scope of play. And there is a point to those games, but they end. They, they are competitive and they have an end state. Software development, well, when is your, when is your product done? When it's retired, when no, nobody wants it anymore. In other words, it turns out that we're actually doing something slightly different here. We are playing to continue playing. We're not playing to finish. We're playing to keep on playing. We're actually trying to put off an end state in some senses. 
And the purpose of the game, although clearly in one sense there is competition, that we are competing perhaps in a market of services and software, with the people that you're working with, it's something slightly different. And this is a cooperative game. It is potentially unbounded. As long as the guessing or the storytelling is interested in the games we're playing. So here, rock climbing, storytelling, carpet wrestling. Rock climbing, yes, there is a competitive sport. But you know what? My, uh, my 16 year old, he does bouldering, he's done some other climbing as well. Why does he do that? He does it because it's fun. He does it because he gets to hang out with his friends. He does it because it gives him a sense of, you know, he gets better at certain things. If, any, if he's competing against anybody, it's himself. It's the improvement. But there's a sheer enjoyment to what he's doing. Um, we do all of these other things sometimes to keep on playing. They're cooperative games. You do these with other people uh, to achieve a, a common shared goal. The point of the game is to interact with each other or perhaps to help out, uh, each other out. Now, that's not the only thing we need to care about games. Time for another word. So if nothing else, you're gonna walk, I want you to walk into the office tomorrow and say, yep, you're all pantsers, and just look at the <laughs> stairs, okay? And you're gonna say, no, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get gnomic. What? Okay, so gnomic is a very uncommon English word. Ridiculously uncommon. Um, it's a game in which changing the rules of the game is a legal move and part of the game. Okay, now if you think about it, most games have a fixed set of rules. The chessboard I showed at the beginning. I can sit down anywhere on the planet with a chess set and lose a game of chess to somebody I don't even share a language with. Okay? Why? Because the rules are understood. We also understand that there are games that are slightly adapted. It turns out everybody's, everybody's got a, a house rule that's different when it comes to playing Monopoly. You go to somebody else's house, they play Monopoly slightly differently. There's a little tweak in the rules. Certain card games have localized adaptations. Okay? And there's all these little... But these are... These are minor variations. What we're talking about here is the very idea of the engine is running and we're going to change parts of it while it's running. Now, the original game, I've never played the original game, um, but the rules are online. It's invented by an um, uh, Australian philosopher, Peter Suber, in the 1980s. Uh, he wished to explore the nature of political constitutions and legal uh, frameworks. You can pass a law to change how you interpret how laws are done. In other words, these are, there's no end state, as it were, to a state. Okay? The, the point is you change how the state runs. You change how the legal framework runs by changing the legal framework. And he wanted to explore this, but on a smaller scale. We see this, legal systems, software development processes, and if you've ever seen kids play, it's astonishing. They don't set out, right, we're going to have a, gonna, gonna have a meeting. Okay? I draw the order. You know, all the four-year-olds and five-year-olds in the room are going to have a meeting about how we're going to play this game. We've got some Lego and we've got some, uh, uh, we've got some toy cars and uh, uh, there's some G.I. Joes left over from my older brother over there. So we're going to do all of this and we need rules. And no, that's not how they do it. You, you go into a place where kids are playing and you're sitting there going, like, I have no idea what they're doing. Dad, you just stepped in the sea. What? That, that's, you know, that, yeah, exactly. You, you stepped in the sea, and it's just like you're sitting there going like, oh, okay, oh, no, no, you can't cross there, that's a minefield. How did that become a minefield? I can't tell the difference between the sea and the minefield. But somehow, this has emerged. They try these little things out. Some of them work out, some of them become convention. And the point is, it turns out they're very good at this. It's somehow, something happens between five years old and 25 years old, we lose it. It turns out this is a surprisingly useful faculty. But if you go and play the original Gnomic, I say, I, I haven't played it, but I have read the rules online. It's an incredibly boring game. <laughs> In other words, what you, will be, what you will do when you start playing it is be motivated to do one of two things. Give up. This is pointless. Or, tell you what, let's change the rules so this makes it a little more interesting. Yeah? This is interesting because my family actually did this. We do play games every now and then. And uh, um, I did a workshop in... Um, uh, Poland, one of the guys got talking to one of the guys uh, running the workshop. He says, oh yeah, me and a friend, we've set up, we've uh, been creating a board game. Um, it's about how to create a software startup. So he sent me a copy. It turned up, uh, I completely forgotten we had the conversation. Two months later at my house, whoosh, board game appears. So play it with my family. And the first time I did it, it's like, yeah, that was a bit okay. There were bits of it that were good, but Kevin, that rule, you know, let's, when next time we play it, let's change the rules. <laughs> So we are hacking on this game. Do you know what this is like? This is like Scrum. It turns out that the initial set of rules is surprisingly boring to play. 
you are not supposed to keep playing the same game. The whole point is you're supposed, it's, this is the bit that makes an agile process agile. It's the gnomic aspect. It's, the iterative and incremental gives you some kind of, yeah, yeah, they all have some aspect of that. But the bit that makes it different is, let's change how we're doing this, see if that's more effective for us. Okay, because it turns out that that team of three people doing embedded software in the corner versus that team of ten people split across two sites doing the web front end are developing different things in different ways. Perhaps they don't need exactly the same things. The whole point of a framework is that it's incomplete. Yeah? In software, a software framework is a half-finished application. Your job is to finish it. Scrum is a process framework. It's not finished. Your job is to finish it and start messing about with it and tinkering. You're supposed to play with it. So there's this idea that what you're looking at is to be playing a gnomic cooperative game. You can keep stringing these adjectives together, but yeah, it gets quite exciting. So uh, a researcher from the Open University in the UK, she gave a lovely keynote a few years ago, and she, she made the point, software development is a social activity with technical practices. There's a lovely way of looking at it, really emphasizing um, that, that aspect um, of this. So I want to close with a return to this question of We've got the idea of co we've got the idea of team. Of course, there are software projects that are developed individually, but most of what we do in organizations is an act of collective intelligence. Okay? Now, this is an observation. I was asked about a bunch of stuff, a bunch of questions for a conference recently, and one of the questions is, what is the advantage, or what would you say is the advantage of autonomously working teams? And what I looked at, what I said is risk reduction. Why risk reduction? Because um, you reduce the amount of things that you don't know through increased group intelligence. Now that's a desire. It turns out what happens if you get a lot of people together? Do you automatically get group intelligence? No, just the same way that you don't automatically learn from your mistakes. You can learn, you can have group intelligence, but it turns out there are a few other things you have to do. So this 2003 book, James Sirowicki's Wisdom of Crowds, uh, had some really good stories in it, but he did have a really nice summary of what makes a, a group of people wise, as opposed to falling into groupthink and stupidity. You know, it turns out that a group of people together can also be surprisingly stupid. Okay? What, what, what moves from one to the other? Four conditions that char uh, characterize wise crowds. Diversity of opinion. Yeah? You, you can't all have the same thought. Independence. You are also allowed to think independently. Decentralization. You are drawing from different sources of knowledge. These are obviously interlinked in one sense, but it, we're basically saying if you've got the same demographics, so a company I um, did some training for in Northern England in Newcastle, pretty much everybody was male, early 20s, computer science graduate, white, uh, and didn't like football. Let's throw that one in there. In other words, you are drawing from a group of people who have the same education and the same background and the same everything. And they were, they were all, yeah, and I was the only southerner in the, in the room, okay? So, um, you know, so, yeah, they're all from up north. Uh, so there's a point there is that, surprisingly enough, they were, they were very easy to teach in one sense because they all sought the same one. You've met one, you've met them all. Um, you know, but... There is this notion of you, you want to be drawing on different backgrounds. You don't want everybody to have this. If you're only comp uh, uh, and you need to be really careful with this. So I mentioned the games industry. I had an interesting um, mentoring gig a few years back in London for a company that was in the financial uh, uh, markets. And they did a lot of financial trading. What I was surprised by when I first turned up is not simply that they were all male, and in this case, all from the south, because this was the south of England. They were all from the games industry. So here you have a financial programming house, and they're all from the games industry. How could this be? Because the department, the guy who moved in, basically, he's now department head. You recruit in your own image. And he said, I need people who really know how to program. The people I trust the most, I mean, honestly, I've met financial programmers. I understand where he's coming from. Uh, yeah, I know. Burns unit is that way. Um, but you know, I know where he's coming from. On the other hand, there is this kind of like slightly self-taught hacky way, which is why I was there. We need to straighten out our technical practices. But the point is, they'd ended up with a monoculture. 
carefully recreated a monoculture. And it's just like, yeah, that's not so smart. All this is of no use unless you can bring it all together. Aggregation, you've got to bring it together. This is the bit, sometimes we do all of the others and then forget this bit. Now, it turns out, how do you aggregate? Well, you hang around the water cooler, you have appropriate numbers of meetings, but it turns out source code is also a place where people meet. It is a collection of knowledge. It's an aggregation. Here is our set of beliefs. And also starts telling you about things like reviewing, pairing, mobbing, um, code ownership strategies, code familiar, all of these things. This is, the, this is the process of aggregation. Your tests, they are also, when I say code, I want you to treat that in the broadest sense possible. If you have a CICD pipeline, that's code, because that is written in codified form. Yeah? There are scripts there that do that. Your tests, they are also code. All of these things are representations of things that people believe. Now, you need to get those together so that we don't end up with silence. We're trying to do the aggregation. So there's a little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of its individual members. Um, in the UK, we call that parliament. Here, I believe it's called Congress. Um, uh, but this is a really interesting observation. If a group includes more women, its collective intelligence rises. Uh, so this is research from uh, 2011. Um, ever since I discovered this, I've changed the way that I do workshops. I don't want to give any team an unfair advantage. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a redistribution. Now, I'm just looking out at you, I'm going to say you could be smarter. Okay? Um, but this is a, a broader and deeper thing, because what you actually find is the nature of communication um, changes, how people communicate. People from diverse backgrounds might actually alter the behavior of a group's social majority in ways that lead to improved and more accurate group thinking. Diverse teams are more likely to constantly re-examine facts and remain objective. Now, I made the point here that if we're playing a game of intelligence and group intelligence and we want to get the most, then we need to look at everything that affects that. And therefore, it is the individuals and interactions and things. So that all of these things contribute. You want to get, you want to bring all of this to bear. So the guy I mentioned earlier on who got me into looking at building architecture, there's a very simple, Alan was always, I, I love doing stuff with Alan. He's a... Uh, he was a lecturer um, at De Montfort University in Leicester in the UK. And what I love is that you know, my background is not originally com uh, computing or computer science. So I did physics originally. Alan's background is he did history. The two of us had the best conversations, honestly. They really were great. But the thing I loved is that Alan's area of research was legacy systems. I thought that was, there was something beautifully reflective in that. He studied history. Now he does legacy systems and software. And so he was always looking at, you know, the social constructs. What, what created this system? Yeah, yeah, there's code. But the code reflects stuff. It's not, it's not the way that people look at code. It's not the questions of the, clean, uh, the cleanliness of the code and how clean it is or anything like that. He wanted to understand the social constructs that led to certain things. And what were the things that were surprisingly successful? The ones that if you told somebody, oh, we'd never do that, that's a stupid idea. I remember when I first met a team that was doing iterationless development, they didn't know that they were doing that. Their iterations were variable length. And at that point, the orthodoxy was, you don't do this. Except that I looked at what they were doing, it's just like, yeah, it seems to be working. You know what? I'm not going to mess with this. <laughs> You've got something that works. I don't necessarily fully understand, and I now do understand it. But it's a case of like, you've got something that works, and actually you're doing a really good job with it. So I will stand back and not give you any more advice on this, because I'm, I'm here to learn from you. Um, so I'm going to end with a familiar template. And we're not very good at applying this to ourselves. We think that this template is for understanding requirements from an external source. A customer wants something from our software. And we have a standard template, we fill it in. As a role, I want a feature so that I achieve the, so there's some benefit. But we are also clients of our own processes. When people say we're, we're doing Scrum, OK, well, that, doesn't, that tells me a little bit, but it doesn't tell me everything. I want to know how you're approaching it. What is your approach to this stuff? Have you changed it? What are the things you're trying? But as a team member, I'm entitled to something. A process is a knowledge system. It's an information system. It's stuff. So what's the requirement I have from it? I want to develop software and improve how I develop software so that I can have fun. Oh, uh, yeah. We can have fun together. Much better. OK? So I think that that is, there is an idea here. We play games to enjoy ourselves. Whether they are competitive or cooperative, 
it's normally to enjoy ourselves. But software has a particular nature. And software is a game of um, interaction. It's a game of cooperation. It's a game where we're actually trying to put off the end. Oh, we want the little victories in between. Yeah, yeah, we've got a release. Yes, result. You know, this is good. We've got great feedback from the customer. But that's what keeps you going. That's the fuel. That's not the end state. That's, that's the thing that keeps it going. And there are things that I don't know, and that's absolutely fine. And then there are things that I know, and I seem to have got better at them, and I feel more comfortable with them, and I enjoy doing that. It gives me confidence to be able to try the next thing that I don't know, rather than living a world of chaos, or this is so boring because I know everything. Okay? You, you don't want to be in either of those states. There's a sort of a sweet spot there. And there is that idea here, and I'm going to shamelessly use the word fun. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, questions, objections, thoughts, reflections, jokes, cheap abuse, or expensive <laughs> abuse, I don't mind. So, um, I, I liked uh, the pleasure element. Um, uh, US, former US poet laureate Mara Pinsky defined poetry as anything that gives pleasure. Yeah. Code is poetry. Yeah. yeah. And it's about that craftsmanship element. So, if I were to, if I were to overlay all the themes that you've shared tonight, what I hear you saying is that the collaborative game, collaborative semi-finite game like jazz, where the first people are going, the essence around that is discovery. Mm. So if we're playing tag, it's discovery. If, um, if we're playing jazz, it's discovery. And mm. then there are these side effects, which is um, we're going to hold each other accountable because we have diverse team members. Yeah. And, and because we're holding these that discovery cannot rely only on your own individual exploration. Yeah. There's a body of knowledge. Yeah. Um, and and then and then and then when we go through that that cycle, the um, P PDSA cycle, it's less about going through the cycle and more about the discovery element, yeah. all towards the goal of life. Yeah. Is that, is that a fair sentence? What Jesse just said. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. So I was uh, looking for the slide that said this is a game. And, yeah. and you didn't have that, you just wasted. No, the whole thing was the slide that said this is a game. It was woven in there. It's you know, it's it's so yeah, but that, that's exactly the kind of the, uh, the idea is, and sometimes the reason we have certain rituals or we may document and put on a slide a process is a reminder, and the problem is it's all too easy to follow in a ritualized form. So let's, let's talk about um, uh, the, the danger that we have of not understanding the deeper side of things uh, is that sometimes you can teach PDSA and you can teach all these other practices and so on, and you say, oh, you know, inspect, adapt, and wanna, you know, build the measure and all the rest of it. And then people sort of look at that and go, OK, that's what I'm going to do. And what they're, what they're seeing is almost like a minimized icon. They don't realize that, actually, this is just the opening. This is the sound bite that draws you in. Uh, and there's another bit. And what I find with a lot of teams is, so when my older boy, who's now there, when he was about there, I remember he did this. And this, was, this, was, you know, this, was, this changed the way I just saw software development uh, from that point on. He tried to help my wife once. The little, little, um, his little brother was at the stage where eating is an activity of food redistribution. Okay. And so he was doing that. So you ended up with kind of stuff everywhere. And so, you know, you get to clear up the table afterwards. So in the way that kids do, he tries to help. If you've had kids at that age, you know that, you know, this is going to take me five minutes. Oh, you're helping. This will take me 15. Um, you know, that, that kind of thing. And what he was doing is he was copying my wife. But he was copying what he could see. He's down here. He doesn't see this hand. <laughs> He's doing this. And what I see a lot of teams doing is, I see your agile. Yeah, that's what we're doing. And they're missing the nuances like, yeah, and, and there's that. And that's the thing is these, all of these forms, these, these rituals and so on, they are about bringing these together. But often what people just see is that. And that's what they do. They go, oh, we don't seem to be going any better. We're doing agile. Honestly, it's a noun, really. It's, uh, it's not, a, or rather, it's not a noun. It's an adjective. It's a description of a property of something. It's not a thing. You can do Scrum, but you, you're, you are agile. So there's that notion there of, of trying to understand that the purpose of these is to bring you closer to the other bit, the nuance, the subtlety. But sometimes we stop short because we're humans. We like simple explanations. We love things to be 
easily compartmentalized. Yeah? But that's our bias. That's our simplicity uh, coming out. You also seem to like two-dimensional things. Yeah. Like, uh, like your cycle, the plan to do study. Yeah. When in reality, if you're limiting study to the lower right-hand corner, you're missing all those opportunities all the way around the circle. Oh, yeah. You see, in other words, this, this, uh, a friend of mine, John Jagger, um, has, has a lovely way of putting it. He says, you only truly understand something when you start seeing the contradictions in it and you've worked out how to improve it. And that's, that's the whole point. These are there to draw you in. And you go, I can why are we doing this only once? Why can't we? I never said you couldn't. But now well, you're asking you're, the question that leads you to the next bit. As you're describing it, I was thinking, really, what you want to be is mindful throughout the entire cycle. Yes. But so you're paying attention at every point yeah. about how can I do this differently. Yes. But there's this notion of getting yourself, um, getting yourself attuned to that. In other words, there is this idea of there is a learning phase. So, for example, you can't just go in and say, hey, teams, you're all empowered, you're self-organizing. Yeah, it turns out that self-organization is a skill and it has to be learned. Okay? And likewise, being mindful, um, there's enough... There's enough videos and books out there on mindfulness. It turns out there are things you have to do to get to the point that some of this stuff makes sense. So it almost, these, some of these are almost training wheels. And eventually they kind of disappear. But we use them. Uh, I mean, I could have talked about the, are you familiar with the Dreyfus skills acquisition model? OK. And a lot of people mistake the Dreyfus skills acquisition model as being a maturity uh, model. Um, you have. Um, Novice, advanced beginner, competent, proficient, expert. And so if you look at it as a maturity model, your goal is to get to the top. And that's not what it's about at all. It's just showing that the nature of your thinking will be different at each level. It is not that you're supposed to go to the next level and drive as fast as possible. Uh, but the nature of your thinking will be at the next level. And so therefore, if you ask an expert, how did you do that? They're probably not able to tell you. And not in any reasonable way. Um, and PDSA and all these other things, they are for this level here. First of all, understand the basic mechanics of it, but then move beyond the mechanics, understand there is a nuance that they are trying to reveal, and then eventually it just disappears away. And it's just like, well, this is just how we do it. It becomes part of your, um, uh, part of your thinking, but you'll also find your thinking has gone in directions you cannot easily explain and put into, as you say, a 2D, a 2D diagram. You know, it's, uh, people... That's the state of my mind. Yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, Chris Alexander, the guy responsible for doing um, uh, sort of inventing patterns, and building architecture, he talked talk about this as being through the gate. You know, you've you've now you've now gone through this. This is absorbed, and you know, this is just how you do it, and you're good at it. But you kind of have to go through the initial stages to get there to understand why you do that. Otherwise, you end up with the danger of the expert beginner. Okay, which is yeah, we see that in a few places. Um, so there is this idea of using these as stepping stones. Um, and, and I think we don't give enough credit for that. In other words, the idea is that if you, had, if you started off doing Scrum, maybe a year later you're doing something that you're still you're uncomfortable. You're using the word sprint, maybe, and you're using words like backlog. But if you were to look at it, you may say, you know what, it doesn't sound anything like the Scrum I'm hearing about from other people. Well, that's fine. You've perhaps, uh, but we're doing really well. Oh, OK. <laughs> In which case, if you say, we're doing something that's not like Scrum because this didn't work for us, this, that didn't work here. And how's your delivery going? Oh, it's a complete mess. It's chaos, everything. You know, buildings burnt down, whatever. We built it ourselves, you know, as a collaboration exercise without instructions, without external knowledge, whatever. The, the whole idea there is if you've got to the point where we just seem to be delivering, keeping people happy, enjoying ourselves, and I think we're pretty good at software development, then stand back and don't interfere because they've now reached that stage. But, for, but to get there, you can't just teleport into it. You, uh, otherwise, you end up with the problem. Um, OK, so here's the thing that uh, kids are taught, and it turns out it's not unique to English. Kids are taught not to start their sentences with the word and or but. Okay. Why? The problem is a lot of adults still hold this rule. No, don't do this. But there is, why, why are kids taught this? It's kind of an interesting question. So your kids have just had a really great summer vacation. It's the first day back at school. What did you do over your vacation? How does the child talk? Oh, we did this and, and then we did this and, and then we did and. In other words, that's their normal way of joining sentences together, particularly when they're excited and in a rush. So the rule is there to kind of hold them back a little bit. 
And then a little bit later, you learn that every now and then, and I've seen novels start on the word but, you suddenly use it and it's exactly the right word. But you can't tell people that immediately. Oh, it's okay to use it sometimes, because they don't understand why it's okay to use it sometimes. So that's the, that's the purpose of that. Brit, to recount the scene from the Sean Connery movie, Flying Little Forester, where he's not the entire time. <laughs> yeah, which you can actually just do as movie snippets. Yeah. 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 But yeah. But uh, your point is really good. We like a certain simplicity to things, and we like a simplicity of explanation. But that's not normally the end. That's a starting point, and then you're supposed to keep going. Any other thoughts, reflections, questions? Yes. So, yeah, so when there's repeated games, right, it's a different dynamic when you don't know for sure how many more times you're going to repeat this game. Yeah. Versus when you know the end is coming soon, yeah. or you know that there's only three games left. Yeah. Right? And typically, things fall apart at the end. Right? That's when people know, well, not when you're playing the game a couple more times, it's time to start to track it. Yeah. Right? Does that matter? From what you've seen in the real world of software development, or not really? I think all of these games so continuing with the. No, I think it does matter. I think there is a a sadness, or it depends. There's a sadness or a relief depending on how the how how the team went. Um, You know, you find uh, sometimes. Sometimes you find the endless project that really should have finished a long time ago and should be dead by all rights and six foot under. Um, But sometimes when a company ends or a product ends, a team is disbanded or something like that, if it's been really successful, but I mean, I don't mean success just in a sort of a simple financial, that's one measure. I mean, actually, the team has really got on as a team. And people kind of look at them and go, yeah, that team. They have a personality as a team. Individually, they're different, but there is, a, there is a, a, an ethos that is very difficult to describe. And when they're disbanded, there is a regret. There can be tears. There can be all kinds of stuff. So there is that notion that it will change them emotionally. On the other hand, if things have not been successful, if things have been dysfunctional, then there is a sense of release. And in fact, you know what? I'm just going to indulge in local acts of arson because that's going to make me a lot happier. Because it's, it's all over. We can burn everything. You know, it's, it's the case. Nothing matters anymore. I, you know, I'm just going to look at pictures of cats on the internet instead of worrying about the build. You know? There are a lot of pictures of cats out on the internet. Okay? So, you know, so, if I'd known we were all going to be laid off, I wouldn't have held my tongue for the last three months. Exactly. So there is this notion there is this notion of if that, is, if that has been the culture you know, so this is the point is that it, um, I, there isn't a fixed answer to what you've just uh, asked but the answer in each case will tell you an awful lot about what went before you know, if there is that sense of regret you know, that, and sometimes you kind of look back and you may have been on projects perhaps you didn't appreciate it at the time but I've, I've looked back at certain things and gone, I felt it was good at the time but now I look back I think that was really good you know, there was just like there was something there that I've not been able to find anywhere else, and you have that. You go, yeah, that was good, and it's a shame that had to end. But perhaps at the time you didn't realise it. So there's these different kind of senses. Whereas there are other things you just like, I could not get out of the building fast enough. You know, that was you know that project. It was either me or that project, and I decided to I jump first. Yeah. So there's those kinds of things. So yeah, I think the answer to your question tells you what's going on. I don't think it's a fixed answer, but it will tell you an awful lot about what happened before that. I mean, it sounds like there's a superimposition of multiple games in, in, yeah. simultaneously because the other game is all the rules get paid, and if I if I if I if I apply too much gnomic um, attitude to that game, mm. um, I may no longer be enjoying my well-paid. Uh, monthly income. I may find myself moved sideways yes. to a team of one. Yeah, and there was a really nice quote I uh, saw on Twitter the other day. Really, intre- I, I can't remember it exactly, but it was along the, uh, along the lines of uh, people generally do not get rewarded or promoted for questioning the system and bucking the system. Yeah? In other words, you get, you get rewarded for fitting in really well and being the best at that system, which is a very different kind of thing. Um, I'm not saying there's no place for that, but when we also talk about disruption and you know, pulling people in new directions because we've learned new things, then we have to understand that the existing reward system is not necessarily set up for that. And so, yeah, uh, there, there is that. Yeah. yeah, you're right, there are a lot of games we play. So you're kind of pulled in these uh, different directions. 
Um, you know, and actually, this is also one that we find, uh, find at home. Uh, when my wife and I play uh, board games, set as a Catan, something like that, with the kids, normally, normally there's, there's something else going on, like we have to, you know, one of us has to cook food or order a takeaway or whatever. That's another game we're playing. Now, I've got a choice here. I can either lay waste to, you know, whatever game we're playing, I can either, or I can go and stop the kitchen burning. You know, I've got a choice here. These are games where I have choices. This is the intersection of two games. Yeah, so we have, there's these other things. And carefully, your mother just rang. Okay, right, that's another game. The family game. There's that kind of whole, you know, yeah, okay, so I need to say this and, you know, whatever. Your mother's going to ask about Christmas. What are we going to do about Christmas? I don't know. Okay, cover. Okay, well, what's I usually say? So when you're playing simultaneously all of these games, they are interleaved. And, and software is basically a lot of these, and some of them aren't acknowledged. Yeah. It's don't burn the kitchen down, but on the other hand, you know, be a good son, and you know, this kind of stuff. Yeah, so, so, yeah. So once you've mastered the idea of one game, you're ready to scale. 3D chess. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. It, my kids saw that the other day in Big Bang Theory. And I said, no, no, we need to watch more original Star Trek. Oh, but Dad, that was the 1960s, man. That was like when you were born. And it's just like, yeah, and? <laughs> People walked on the moon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> after I was born, so, you know, what have you got to show for the century? Yeah, okay, I can't quite lay that on my kids' feet yet, but yeah, uh, uh, yeah, 3D chess, that, that's the next step. 3D gnomic chess, there is actually, you, there is actually regular 2D gnomic chess, I'd, um, but uh, I don't know anything about it, but uh, 3D chess, there we go. Right, okay, so, there's a right. raffle, I believe. Uh, no? Yeah, we're going to give away a book uh, before we uh, get to that. Oh. Uh, be sure I didn't uh, mention this at the beginning, but there's a little rough tucker rubber made thing out there with these three cards. Feel free to leave a green card if you love the space, love the food. Uh, sorry there wasn't enough. I think there was a mix-up in most of the Tech Talk people who actually ate the food that I made set up. So. Sorry about that. If you need any food, uh, come back next time. We'll have I usually order. Right, 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 right. Right. You see, that was a competitive game, and I think they won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yellow, yeah, there are some things there, too. We can improve, so go ahead and leave us a note. Red's like, I may not come back unless you do this thing. So feel free to do that on as a host. But also, uh, Kevin would love to hear from you yep. guys as well, so leave, leave cards and leave notes uh, along those lines as well. So. And if you're colorblind, you can ask people to help you. Yes. We're five away compliant. <laughs> All right, uh, we're going to hand out uh, Essential Scrum, since this was about playing the game and the rules of Scrum somewhat. Some, oh, this yeah. This is what we, we, we have cross here. over. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I wonder if you can do the honors. Who's, uh, who's got money? Take the call. Yeah. 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 Come on, okay, yeah, yeah. I think, I, I think I've got it. I think I've got it, yeah. Oh, no. Someone didn't write the name on it. All right, we're looking for number 9732. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice. Nicely done. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, let's thank uh, Kevin one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be back again. We'd love to host you again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks for all coming out. Um, drive safe. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, 9732, that's a good number. Yeah, descending sequence. <laughs>